My name is William Rowe, and this is the signed affidavit I provided in the city of Edmonton, Alberta, on the 26th of August, 1957. Ever since I was a small boy back in the forest of Michigan, I have studied the lives and habits of wild animals. Later, when I supported my family in northern Alberta by hunting and trapping, I spent many hours just observing the wild things. They fascinated me. But the most incredible experience I ever had with a wild creature occurred near a little town called Tet John Cash, British Columbia, about 80 miles west of Jasper, Alberta. I had been working on the highway for about two years. In October 1955, I decided to climb five miles up Micah Mountain to an old deserted mine just for something to do. I came in sight of the mine about three o'clock in the afternoon after an easy climb. I had just come out of a patch of low brush into a clearing when I saw what I thought was a grizzly bear in the bush on the other side. I had shot a grizzly near that spot the year before. This one was only about 75 yards away, but I didn't want to shoot it for I had no way of getting it out. So I sat down on a small rock and watched my rifle in my hands. I could see part of the animal's head and the top of one shoulder. A moment later it raised up and stepped out into the opening. Then I saw it was not a bear. This, to the best of my recollection, is what the creature looked like and how it acted as it came across the clearing directly toward me. My first impression was of a huge man, about six feet tall, almost three feet wide, and probably weighing somewhere near 300 pounds. It was covered from head to foot with dark brown silver-tipped hair. But as it came closer, I saw by its breast that it was female. And yet, its torso was not curved like a female's. Its broad frame was straight from shoulder to hip. Its arms were much thicker than a man's arms and longer, reaching almost to its knees. Its feet were broader proportionately than a man's, about five inches wide at the front and tapering to much thinner heels. When it walked, it placed the heel of its foot down first, and I could see the gray-brown skin or hide on the soles of its feet. It came to the edge of the bush I was hiding in, within 20 feet of me, and squatted down on its haunches. Reaching out its hands, it pulled the branches of bushes toward it and stripped the leaves with its teeth. Its lips curled flexibly around the leaves as it ate. I was close enough to see that its teeth were white and even. The head was higher at the back than at the front. The nose was broad and flat. The lips and chin protruded farther than its nose. But the hair that covered it, leaving bare only the parts of its face around the mouth, nose and ears made it resemble an animal as much as a human. None of this hair, even on the back of its head, was longer than an inch and that on its face was much shorter. Its ears were shaped like a human's ears. But its eyes were small and black like a bear's. And its neck also was unhuman, thicker and shorter than any man's I had ever seen. As I watched this creature, I wondered if some movie company was making a film at this place and that what I saw was an actor, made up to look partly human and partly animal. But as I observed it more, I decided it would be impossible to fake such a specimen. Anyway, I learned later there was no such company near that area. Nor, in fact, did anyone live up Micah Mountain, according to the people who lived in Ted John Cash. 
Finally, the wild thing must have got my scent, for it looked directly at me through an opening in the brush. A look of amazement crossed its face. It looked so comical at the moment I had to grin. Still in a crouched position, it backed up three or four short steps, then straightened up to its full height and started to walk rapidly back the way it had come. For a moment it watched me over its shoulder as it went, not exactly afraid, but as though it wanted no contact with anything strange. The thought came to me that if I shot it, I would possibly have a specimen of great interest to scientists the world over. I had heard stories of the Sasquatch, the giant hairy Indians that live in the legends of British Columbia Indians and also many claim are still in fact alive today. Maybe this was a Sasquatch, I told myself. I leveled my rifle. The creature was still walking rapidly away, again turning its head to look in my direction. I lowered the rifle. Although I have called the creature it, I felt now that it was a human being and I knew I would never forgive myself if I killed it. Just as it came to the other patch of brush, it threw its head back and made a peculiar noise that seemed to be half laugh and half language and which I can only describe as a kind of a whinny. Then it walked from the small brush into a stand of lodgepole pine. I stepped out into the opening and looked across a small ridge just beyond the pine to see if I could see it again. It came out on the ridge a couple of hundred yards away from me tipped its head back again, and again emitted the only sound I had heard it make. But what this half-laugh, half-language was meant to convey, I do not know. It disappeared then, and I never saw it again. I wanted to find out if it lived on vegetation entirely, or ate meat as well, so I went down and looked for signs. I found it in five different places and, although I examined it thoroughly, could find no hair or shells of bugs or insects. So I believe it was strictly a vegetarian. I found one place where it had slept for a couple of nights under a tree. Now the nights were cool up the mountain at this time of year especially, and yet it had not used a fire. I found no sign that it possessed even the simplest of tools, nor a single companion while in this place. Whether this was a Sasquatch, I do not know. It will always remain a mystery to me, unless another one is found. I hereby declare the above statement to be, in every part, true to the best of my powers of observation and recollection. William Rowe, Edmonton, Alberta, 1957. Thanks for watching and remember to like, subscribe and hit the notification button. We'd also like to hear your views on Bigfoot so share your comments and check out our channel page for loads more great content. If you'd like to help us to produce and curate more Bigfoot-related documentaries, you can go to the About section of the channel page for links to support our Patreon and PayPal.